Welcome to USMLE Step 1 Immunology, Lymphatic Drainage Associations. In this video, we will cover this table from the first aid book. There will be USMLE questions associated with each cluster to test the knowledge and memory. If you have not done so, please click like and subscribe. Thank you. Now, let's start. The first lymph node cluster. The submandibular and submental lymph nodes are situated in the head and neck region and primarily drain the oral cavity, anterior tongue, and lower lip. These nodes are clinically significant because they are common sites for malignancy and metastasis originating from the oral cavity. Look at the clusters in the circle. Now, let's try some questions. Question 1. A 62-year-old man presents to the clinic with a painless lump under his jaw that has been progressively enlarging over the past two months. On physical examination, a non-tender mass is palpated in the submandibular region. A biopsy of the mass is consistent with squamous cell carcinoma. From which of the following areas is this malignancy most likely to have originated? A. Posterior pharynx. B. Nasal cavity. C. Oral cavity. D. External ear. E. Subglottic region. The answer is, C. Oral cavity. The submandibular lymph nodes are responsible for draining the oral cavity, anterior tongue, and lower lip. The patient's biopsy shows squamous cell carcinoma in the submandibular region, which makes it most likely that the malignancy originated from the oral cavity. Next question. A 45-year-old woman comes in for evaluation of a white patch on her lower lip that will not heal. She has a 30-pack year smoking history. A biopsy is obtained, revealing carcinoma in situ. If this lesion were to become invasive, which of the following lymph node clusters would most likely show initial involvement? A. Cervical. B. Submental and submandibular. C. Axillary. D. Inguinal. E. Mediastinal. The answer is, B. Submental and submandibular. The submental and submandibular lymph nodes are primarily responsible for draining the oral cavity, including the lower lip. Given the patient's carcinoma in situ on the lower lip, if this lesion were to become invasive, the submental and submandibular lymph nodes would be the most likely sites for initial lymphatic spread. One more question. A 55-year-old man with a history of chronic alcohol abuse presence with difficulty swallowing and a persistent sore throat. Examination reveals a lesion on the anterior tongue. Which of the following groups of lymph nodes would you examine first for metastasis? A. Superclavicular lymph nodes. B. Parotid lymph nodes. C. Preauricular lymph nodes. D. Submental and submandibular lymph nodes. E. Posterior cervical lymph nodes. The answer is D. Submental and submandibular lymph nodes. Given that the patient's lesion is located on the anterior tongue, the submental and submandibular lymph nodes would be the most appropriate nodes to examine for potential metastasis. These nodes are responsible for draining the oral cavity and the anterior tongue, which includes the area where the lesion is located. Chronic alcohol abuse is considered a risk factor for oral cancer, including cancers of the tongue. The questions mention of a history of chronic alcohol abuse in a 55-year-old man presenting with symptoms like difficulty swallowing and a persistent sore throat is designed to raise the index of suspicion for malignancy, including oral cancer. Next lymph node cluster is deep cervical. The deep cervical lymph nodes are situated along the internal jugular vein in the neck. These nodes primarily drain the head, neck, and oropharynx. Clinically significant, the deep cervical nodes are commonly involved in upper respiratory tract infections, infectious mononucleosis, Kawasaki disease, as well as malignancies of the head, neck, and oropharynx. Let's try some questions. A 19-year-old college student presents with fever, sore throat, and fatigue lasting for one week. Physical examination reveals cervical lymphadenopathy. A blood test confirms infectious mononucleosis. Which group of lymph nodes is most commonly involved in this condition? A. Axillary. B. Parotid. C. Deep cervical. D. Inguinal. E. Mediastinal. The answer is, C. Deep cervical. Infectious mononucleosis often presents with cervical lymphadenopathy. The deep cervical lymph nodes are commonly involved due to their role in draining the head, neck, and oropharynx where the infection frequently occurs. A. Five-year-old child presents with fever, bilateral conjunctival injection, and a rash. The patient also has swollen lymph nodes on physical examination. 
Which of the following conditions often involves the deep cervical lymph nodes and is also likely in this patient? A. Measles. B. Kawasaki disease. C. Scarlet fever. D. Rubella. E. Chickenpox. The answer is B. Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease commonly presents with fever, bilateral conjunctival injection, and a rash. Deep cervical lymph nodes are often involved due to their role in draining the head and neck region. One more question for this cluster. A 60-year-old man with a 40-pack year smoking history presents with a persistent sore throat and hoarseness. On examination, there is a lesion in the oropharynx and enlarged deep cervical lymph nodes. If malignancy is suspected, where is the most likely primary site? A. Larynx. B. Oropharynx. C. Esophagus. D. Nasopharynx. E. Lung. The answer is, B. Oropharynx. Given the man's symptoms and smoking history, malignancy of the oropharynx should be highly suspected. The deep cervical lymph nodes, which drain the head, neck and oropharynx, would be a common site for metastasis in this scenario. The supraclavicular lymph nodes are located just above the clavicle and serve as a key sentinel point for diagnosing systemic disease. The right supraclavicular nodes primarily drain the right hemothorax. While the left supraclavicular node, often referred to as Virchow's node, drains the left hemothorax, abdomen, and pelvis, they are of significant clinical concern when enlarged or palpable, as they are often associated with malignancies of the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. Ready for some questions? A 50-year-old woman presents with unintentional weight loss and a palpable mass above her left clavicle. A biopsy of the mass is consistent with adenocarcinoma. Which of the following is the most likely primary site of her malignancy? A. Left lung. B. Stomach. C. Right breast. D. Left breast. E. Pancreas. The answer is B. Stomach. A palpable mass in the left supraclavicular area, known as Virchow's node, often suggests a malignancy originating from the abdomen or pelvis. In this case, given the adenocarcinoma, the stomach is the most likely primary site. Next question. A 70-year-old man comes to the clinic complaining of persistent cough and weight loss. On examination, a mass is palpated above the right clavicle. Which of the following is the most likely source of the malignancy? A. Right lung. B. Left lung. C. Prostate. D. Colon. E. Ovaries. The answer is A. Right lung. The right supraclavicular lymph nodes primarily drain the right hemothorax. Given the man's symptoms of persistent cough and weight loss, a malignancy of the right lung is highly suspected. Try this. A 55-year-old man with a known history of colorectal cancer presents with a new palpable mass above his left clavicle. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for this finding? A. New primary malignancy in the left lung. B. Metastasis from the colorectal cancer. C. Benign cyst. D. Infectious etiology. E. Lymphoma. The answer is B. Metastasis from the colorectal cancer. Given the patient's known history of colorectal cancer, the presence of a mass in the left supraclavicular area, Virchow's node, is most likely due to metastasis from the colorectal cancer, as this node drains the abdomen and pelvis. Mediastinal lymph nodes. The mediastinal lymph nodes are situated in the mediastinum and primarily drain the trachea and esophagus. These lymph nodes are clinically significant as they are commonly involved in pulmonary tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, lung cancer, and other granulomatous diseases. Involvement of these nodes often reflects disease processes that are more systemic or advanced, and thus they warrant special clinical attention. Questions time. A 42-year-old man with a history of chronic cough presents with hemoptysis and night sweats. A chest x-ray reveals unilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Which of the following lymph node clusters is most likely involved? A. Axillary. B. Deep cervical. C. Mediastinal. D. Inguinal. E. Supraclavicular. The answer is C. Mediastinal. The patient's symptoms and unilateral hilar lymphadenopathy on chest x ray are suggestive of pulmonary tuberculosis. The mediastinal lymph nodes, which drain the trachea, are often involved in pulmonary tuberculosis. Next question. A 36-year-old woman presents with dry cough, fatigue, and dyspnea. Chest x-ray shows bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. 
A lung biopsy is consistent with non casseting granulomas. Which additional clinical finding is most likely associated with this condition? A. Oral thrush. B. Uveitis. C. Wheezing. D. Joint pain. E. Hepatomegaly. The answer is B. Uveitis. The patient's symptoms and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, along with non casseting granulomas on biopsy, are indicative of sarcoidosis. Uveitis is a commonly associated ocular manifestation of sarcoidosis. Try this one. A 65 year old man with a 50 pack year smoking history presents with worsening cough and unexplained weight loss. A CT scan reveals a mass in the right lung along with enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. What is the most likely type of lung cancer? given the patient's history and findings. A. Small cell lung cancer. B. Adenocarcinoma. C. Squamous cell carcinoma. D. Large cell carcinoma. E. Mesothelioma. The answer is A. Small cell lung cancer. Given the patient's significant smoking history and the rapid progression of symptoms along with mediastinal lymph node involvement, small cell lung cancer is the most likely diagnosis. This type of lung cancer is strongly associated with smoking and tends to metastasize early. One more question. A 28-year-old man presents with cough, fever, and malaise. A chest x-ray reveals mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Laboratory tests are inconclusive. A biopsy of the lymph node is planned. Which of the following would be a strong indicator of a granulomatous disease if found on biopsy? A. Reed Sternberg cells. B. Non casseting granulomas. C. Viral inclusions. D. Amyloid deposits. E. Necrotizing vasculitis. The answer is B. Non casseting granulomas. Non casseting granulomas are a hallmark of granulomatous diseases. The presence of these structures in a biopsy of mediastinal lymph nodes, as in the picture, which are often involved in granulomatous diseases, would strongly suggest such a diagnosis. Next is hilar lymph nodes. The hilar lymph nodes are located adjacent to where the bronchi enter the lungs and primarily serve to drain the lung tissues. These nodes are often implicated in diseases such as pulmonary tuberculosis, often unilateral hilar involvement, sarcoidosis, usually bilateral hilar involvement, lung cancer, and various granulomatous diseases. Their involvement in these diseases is clinically significant and often suggests more severe or systemic forms of disease. Question. A 30-year-old woman presents with a three-week history of dry cough and intermittent fever. A chest x-ray reveals unilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Which organism is most likely responsible for this presentation? A. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. B. Streptococcus pneumoniae. C. Histoplasma capsulatum. D. Pneumocystis gyrovecchiae. E. Chlamydia pneumoniae. The answer is A. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Unilateral hilar lymphadenopathy in the context of a chronic cough and fever is most suggestive of tuberculosis, caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Histoplasmosis, caused by histoplasma capsulatum, may also present in a similar fashion and serves as a reasonable secondary answer. A 45-year-old male presents with fatigue, dry cough, and dyspnea. Chest x-ray shows bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Serum calcium is found to be elevated. Which of the following is most likely associated with this condition? A. Elevated ACE levels. B. Decreased FEV1 slash FEC ratio. C. Positive rheumatoid factor. D. Elevated ESR. E. Positive ANA. The answer is A. Elevated ACE levels. Bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, along with elevated calcium levels, strongly suggests sarcoidosis. Angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, levels are often elevated in sarcoidosis. Answer D. Elevated ESR. Elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR, could also be a secondary answer, as it may indicate inflammation or infection. A 68 year old man with a history of heavy smoking presence with cough, weight loss, and shortness of breath. A CT scan shows a mass in the left or lung lobe with hilar lymphadenopathy. Which molecular marker could suggest a better prognosis in non-small cell lung cancer? A. ALK rearrangement. B. CRAS mutation. C. EGFR mutation. D. PDL1 expression. E. Metamplification. The answer is 
A. ALK rearrangement. ALK rearrangement and EGFR mutations are often associated with a better response to targeted therapies in non small cell lung cancer, potentially offering a more favorable prognosis. A 32 year old man with no significant medical history presents with fatigue, cough, and night sweats. Chest X ray shows hyalur lymphadenopathy. Lab shows elevated liver enzymes. Biopsy of a lymph node shows non cassiating granulomas. Which of the following findings would most support a diagnosis of sarcoidosis over tuberculosis? A. Negative PPD test. B. Positive AFB stain. C. Cassiating granulomas. D. Positive sputum culture for mycobacterium tuberculosis. The answer is A. Negative PPD test. A negative purified protein derivative, PPD, test would make tuberculosis less likely and would support a diagnosis of sarcoidosis when non cassiating granulomas are present. Elevated liver enzymes could serve as a secondary clue, as hepatic involvement can occur in sarcoidosis but is less commonly seen in tuberculosis. The axillary lymph nodes the axillary lymph nodes are situated in the underarm area and mainly serve to drain the upper limb, breast, and skin above the umbilicus. They are often implicated in breast-related pathologies, such as mastitis and breast cancer metastasis. Clinically, these nodes are a significant focus for the evaluation of upper limb infections and breast diseases. Question. A 32-year-old woman who is breastfeeding her two-month-old infant comes to the clinic with localized breast pain and erythema. On examination, her axillary lymph nodes are tender and enlarged. Which organism is most commonly responsible for her condition? A. Staphylococcus aureus. B. Escherichia coli. C. Pseudomonas aeruginosa. D. Streptococcus agalactiae. E. Congida albicans. The answer is A. Staphylococcus aureus. The symptoms of localized breast pain, erythema, and tender, enlarged axillary lymph nodes in a breastfeeding woman are indicative of mastitis. The most common causative agent for lactational mastitis is Staphylococcus aureus. Next question. A 45-year-old woman with a lump in her left breast undergoes mammography, which shows findings suggestive of malignancy. A biopsy confirms invasive ductal carcinoma. Which lymph node cluster should be examined preoperatively for staging? A. Mediastinal. B. Hyler. C. Axillary. D. Deep cervical. E. Inguinal. The answer is, C. Axillary. In breast cancer cases, the axillary lymph nodes are the most commonly involved in metastasis and are crucial for staging and guiding treatment. One more. A 65-year-old man presents with a wound infection on his right forearm. On examination, his axillary lymph nodes are enlarged and tender. Which additional symptom would most likely suggest systemic involvement? A. Fever. B. Palpitations. C. Hypertension. D. Tinnitus. E. Dyspnea. The answer is A. Fever. Fever in the context of a localized infection and lymphadenopathy suggests systemic involvement, which may require more aggressive treatment and possible hospitalization. The epitrochlear lymph nodes. The epitrochlear lymph nodes are located near the elbow and are responsible for draining the hand and forearm. These nodes are not commonly involved in many diseases but are notably associated with secondary syphilis. Enlarged epitrochlear lymph nodes can be a clue to this diagnosis and may warrant further investigation, such as serological tests. Try this question. A 24-year-old man presents with a non-itchy skin rash that started on his trunk and has now spread to his palms and soles. On physical examination, you note bilateral epitrochlear lymphadenopathy. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Lyme disease. B. Scabies. C. Secondary syphilis. D. Contact dermatitis. E. Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The answer is C. Secondary syphilis. The patient's symptoms of a rash involving the palms and soles, along with bilateral epitrochlear lymphadenopathy, are highly suggestive of secondary syphilis. The epitrochlear nodes are notably involved in this stage of syphilis. Which of the following tests would be most useful in confirming the diagnosis for the patient described in the previous question? A. LISA for HIV. B. Zonk smear. C. Rapid plasma reagent, RPR. D. Co-preparation. 
E. PCR for Borrelia. The answer is C. Rapid Plasma Reagent, RPR. Rapid Plasma Reagent, RPR, is a serologic test commonly used to screen for syphilis. In the context of the symptoms and physical findings described, an RPR test would be the most appropriate next step for diagnosis. Next, a 50 year old construction worker presents with a cut on his left forearm. On physical examination, enlarged epitrochlear lymph nodes are noted. What is the most likely cause of his lymphadenopathy? A. Lyme disease. B. Cat scratch disease. C. Secondary syphilis. D. Localized bacterial infection. E. Leukemia. The answer is D. Localized bacterial infection. Given the recent history of a cut on the forearm and the area drained by the epitrochlear nodes, hand and forearm, the most likely cause of lymphadenopathy in this case would be a localized bacterial infection. One more question for this cluster. You are working in a sexually transmitted infection clinic. A 30-year-old man presents complaining of a sore on his genitalia. On physical examination, you also notice epitrochlear lymphadenopathy. What is the most appropriate next step in management? A. Start empiric antibiotics for bacterial vaginosis. B. Obtain a serologic test for syphilis. C. Prescribe antiviral therapy for herpes. D. Advise the use of antifungal cream. E. Start treatment for scabies. The answer is B. Obtain a serologic test for syphilis. The presence of a genital sore and epitrochlear lymphadenopathy raises suspicion for syphilis. The most appropriate next step would be to obtain a serologic test for syphilis, such as RPR, to confirm the diagnosis. Celiac lymph nodes. The celiac lymph nodes are situated around the celiac trunk near the upper abdomen. These nodes serve to drain areas like the liver, stomach, spleen, pancreas, and upper duodenum. They may be involved in a variety of gastrointestinal diseases, including mesenteric lymphadenitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and celiac disease. Enlargement or pathology in these nodes could signal underlying GI tract issues that require further evaluation. Ready for some questions? A 40-year-old man presents with recurrent bouts of abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea. Stool studies are negative for infectious etiologies. Imaging reveals mesenteric lymphadenitis. What is the most likely associated disease? A. Inflammatory bowel disease. B. Gastroenteritis. C. Celiac disease. D. Irritable bowel syndrome. E. Cholecystitis. The answer is A. Inflammatory bowel disease. The presence of recurrent abdominal pain, diarrhea, and mesenteric lymphadenitis in imaging is suggestive of inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Next question. A 25-year-old woman presents with chronic diarrhea, weight loss, and abdominal pain. She is found to have enlarged celiac lymph nodes on abdominal imaging. Which serologic marker is most likely to be elevated in this patient? A. Anti-TTGIGA. B. Anti-Smith antibodies. C. Anti-TSNA. D. Anti-CCP. E. Rheumatoid factor. The answer is a. Anti-TTGIGA. The symptoms of chronic diarrhea, weight loss, abdominal pain, and enlarged celiac lymph nodes could point to celiac disease. The most commonly used serologic test for celiac disease is the anti-tissue transglutaminase IgA. A 60-year-old male with a history of heavy alcohol use presence with worsening upper abdominal pain radiating to the back. Abdominal imaging shows an enlarged pancreas and swollen celiac lymph nodes. Which tumor marker may be elevated in this patient? A CA19-9. BCA125. CCEA. D. AFP. E. PSA. The answer is. A CA19-9. The patient's symptoms of upper abdominal pain radiating to the back, along with an enlarged pancreas and swollen celiac lymph nodes, raise suspicion for pancreatic cancer. CA19-9 is a tumor marker that may be elevated in this condition. One more. A 35-year-old woman presents with fever, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. An ultrasound reveals an inflamed terminal ileum and enlarged celiac lymph nodes. Which medication is most likely to alleviate her symptoms? A. Metronidazole. B. Infliximab. C. Ranitidine. D. Leprazole. E. Leparamide. 
The answer is B. Infliximab. The presence of an inflamed terminal ileum and enlarged celiac lymph nodes, in conjunction with her symptoms, is suggestive of inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease. Infliximab, a TNF-alpha inhibitor, is often effective in treating such symptoms in Crohn's disease. The superior mesenteric lymph nodes. The superior mesenteric lymph nodes are located in the vicinity of the superior mesenteric artery and drain the lower duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and the colon up to the splenic flexure. Pathological conditions affecting these nodes often include mesenteric lymphadenitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and celiac disease. These conditions may manifest as abdominal pain, changes in bowel habits, and malabsorption symptoms, warranting further diagnostic evaluation. Let's do some questions. A 25-year-old male presents with chronic diarrhea, weight loss and a recent episode of bloody stools. An MRI shows stricturing in the ileum and enlarged superior mesenteric lymph nodes. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Ulcerative colitis. B. Crohn's disease. C. Celiac disease. D. Ischemic colitis. E. Infectious colitis. The answer is B. Crohn's disease. The presence of chronic diarrhea, weight loss, bloody stools, stricturing in the ileum, and enlarged superior mesenteric lymph nodes is most consistent with Crohn's disease, which can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract from the mouth to the anus. The answer is not A because ulcerative colitis, on the other hand, generally involves the colon and the rectum, usually presenting with bloody diarrhea and mucosal inflammation that is continuous and starts at the rectum. It doesn't usually cause stricturing in the ileum or enlarged superior mesenteric lymph nodes that would drain the ileum. Therefore, given the ileal involvement and the findings on imaging, Crohn's disease is more likely than ulcerative colitis in this case. Next question. Following the diagnosis in previous question, the patient is started on azathioprine. What is the mechanism of action of this medication? A. Inhibits dihydrorotate dehydrogenase. B. Inhibition of TNF-alpha. C. Inhibition of purine synthesis. D. Inhibition of DNA gyrase. E. Blockade of voltage-gated sodium channels. The answer is C. Inhibition of purine synthesis. Azathioprine inhibits purine synthesis, leading to reduced DNA and RNA synthesis. This impairs lymphocyte proliferation and function, and is used as an immunosuppressive agent in conditions like Crohn's disease. Next, a 30-year-old woman with a history of celiac disease presents with worsening diarrhea and abdominal pain. Imaging reveals enlarged superior mesenteric lymph nodes. Which serological marker is likely to be elevated in this patient? A. Anti-TTGIGA B. Anca C. Anti-Smith antibodies D. Anti-TSNA E. HLA-B27 The answer is A. Anti-TTGIGA Given her history of celiac disease and the new findings of enlarged superior mesenteric lymph nodes, it is likely that the anti-tissue transglutaminase IgA marker will be elevated, indicating ongoing or exacerbated celiac disease. One more. A 22-year-old woman presents with abdominal pain and fever. Ultrasound reveals an inflamed appendix and enlarged superior mesenteric lymph nodes. She is started on ceftriaxone and metronidazole. What is the mechanism of action of ceftriaxone? A. Inhibition of DNA gyrase. B. Inhibition of cell wall synthesis. C. Disruption of bacterial cell membrane. D. Inhibition of protein synthesis. E. Inhibition of folic acid synthesis. The answer is B. Inhibition of cell wall synthesis. Ceftriaxone is a third generation cephalosporin antibiotic that works by inhibiting bacterial cell wall synthesis. It is often used in combination with metronidazole to cover anaerobes in the treatment of appendicitis. The inferior mesenteric lymph nodes are located around the inferior mesenteric artery and primarily drain the colon from the splenic flexure to the upper rectum. These nodes can be implicated in various gastrointestinal pathologies such as mesenteric lymphadenitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and celiac disease. Conditions affecting these nodes often present with abdominal pain, changes in bowel habits, and other gastrointestinal symptoms. Let's try some questions. A 50-year-old man presents with recurrent abdominal pain and alternating bouts of diarrhea and constipation. He has lost 15 pounds over the past six months. 
On colonoscopy, a mass is seen in the descending colon, and imaging shows enlarged inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Irritable bowel syndrome. B. Crohn's disease. C. Ulcerative colitis. D. Diverticulitis. E. Colorectal cancer. The answer is, E. Colorectal cancer. The age of the patient, chronic gastrointestinal symptoms, and unintentional weight loss, along with the presence of a mass in the colon and enlarged inferior mesenteric lymph nodes, are highly suggestive of colorectal cancer. Following the diagnosis of colorectal cancer in the previous question, the patient is started on 5 fluorouracil 5-FU. What is the mechanism of action of this drug? A. Inhibition of toposomerase 2. B. Inhibition of DNA synthesis. C. Inhibition of mTOR. D. Blockade of VEGF receptors. E. Inhibition of proteasome. The answer is B. Inhibition of DNA synthesis. 5-fluorouracil is a chemotherapy agent that inhibits the enzyme thymidylate synthase, which is crucial for the synthesis of the DNA nucleotide thymidine. This ultimately leads to the inhibition of DNA synthesis and cell death. Next question. A 35-year-old woman with a known diagnosis of celiac disease complains of abdominal pain and anemia is found on labs. Imaging shows enlarged inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. Which of the following is the most likely complication? A. Hemochromatosis. B. Osteoporosis. C. Iron deficiency anemia. D. Megaloblastic anemia. E. Thalassemia. The answer is, C. Iron deficiency anemia. Given her known diagnosis of celiac disease, the abdominal pain and anemia are likely due to malabsorption of nutrients, including iron, which would lead to iron deficiency anemia. The enlarged inferior mesenteric lymph nodes may indicate ongoing or exacerbated celiac disease. One more. A 26-year-old man presents with bloody diarrhea, fever, and weight loss. Imaging reveals an inflamed sigmoid colon and enlarged inferior mesenteric lymph nodes. He is started on sulfasalazine. What is the mechanism of action of sulfasalazine? A. Folic acid antagonist. B. TNF-alpha inhibitor. C. COX-2 inhibitor. D. Inhibition of interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. E. Inhibition of dihydrofolate reductase. The answer is A. Folic acid antagonist. The symptoms of bloody diarrhea, fever, and weight loss, along with the imaging findings of an inflamed sigmoid colon and enlarged inferior mesenteric lymph nodes, are highly suggestive of ulcerative colitis. For the treatment of this condition, the patient is started on sulfasalazine. Sulfasalazine is metabolized into sulfapyridine and 5-aminosalicylic acid, 5-ASA. While the exact mechanism of action is not entirely understood, the 5-ASA component is thought to have an anti-inflammatory effect in the colon. The sulfapyridine component acts as a folic acid antagonist, inhibiting bacterial growth in the gut which might contribute to inflammation. The sister Mary Joseph node, also known as the periumbilical node, drains areas of the abdomen and pelvis. An enlarged or palpable sister Mary Joseph node is often an ominous clinical sign, commonly associated with metastatic gastric cancer. The node may also be involved in other abdominal malignancies and is typically discovered during physical examination as a firm, non-tender nodule at or near the umbilicus. Question time. A 65-year-old man comes in for an evaluation of a new nodule around his umbilicus that he noticed a month ago. He also reports weight loss and early satiety. Endoscopy reveals a mass in the stomach. Biopsy confirms gastric adenocarcinoma. What is the significance of the umbilical nodule? A. An abscess resulting from a previous umbilical hernia surgery. B. A benign cyst. C. A metastatic deposit from the gastric adenocarcinoma. D. A sign of a retroperitoneal hematoma. E. A manifestation of an umbilical hernia. The answer is, C. A metastatic deposit from the gastric adenocarcinoma. The presence of a new umbilical nodule along with symptoms of weight loss and early satiety, in the setting of confirmed gastric adenocarcinoma, indicates that the nodule is likely a metastatic deposit from the gastric cancer, commonly referred to as Sister Mary Joseph's node. Continue with the last question. Given the diagnosis of metastatic gastric cancer in the patient from the previous question, he is started on a regimen that includes trastuzumab. What is the mechanism of action of trastuzumab? 
A. VEGF receptor antagonist. B. HER2 slash NOI receptor antagonist. C. mTOR inhibitor. D. DNA alkylating agent. E. Proteasome inhibitor. The answer is B. HER2 slash NOI receptor antagonist. Trastezumab is a monoclonal antibody that targets the HER2 slash NOI receptor, commonly overexpressed in some types of gastric and breast cancers. By inhibiting this receptor, Trastezumab slows down the growth and proliferation of cancer cells that overexpress her 2 noi The patient from the previous case undergoes a CT scan of the abdomen, which shows metastases to the liver and peritoneum. He asks about his prognosis. Which of the following best describes the stage of his cancer? A. Stage 1. B. Stage 2. C. Stage 3. D. Stage 4. E. Stage 0. The answer is... D. Stage 4. The presence of metastatic deposits in the liver and peritoneum, along with the primary gastric adenocarcinoma and sister Mary Joseph's node, indicate that the patient's cancer is at a stage where it has spread to distant organs. This corresponds to stage 4 disease, which unfortunately carries a poor prognosis. Para-aortic lymph nodes. The para-aortic lymph nodes are situated along the aorta and receive lymphatic drainage from the testes, ovaries, kidneys, fallopian tubes, and uterus. Due to this broad area of drainage, these nodes are a common site for metastasis from various genitourinary and reproductive organs. When enlarged, they may indicate advanced or metastatic disease and may guide further treatment and prognosis. Let's try some questions. A 35-year-old woman presents with irregular menses and pelvic pain. Imaging reveals a 10-centimeter complex ovarian mass and enlarged para-aortic lymph nodes. A biopsy of the mass is positive for serous adenocarcinoma. Which tumor marker is most commonly elevated in this type of ovarian cancer? A CA125. B. Alpha fetoprotein. C. CEA. D. PSA. E. HCG. The answer is a CA125. Serous adenocarcinoma of the ovary is often associated with elevated levels of CA125. The presence of enlarged para-aortic lymph nodes suggests the possibility of metastatic disease. Continue with the previous question. In the patient described in the previous question, what is the next best step for determining the extent of metastatic disease? A. Colonoscopy. B. MRI of the brain. C. PET-CT scan. D. Bone marrow biopsy. E. Liver function tests. The answer is C. PET-CT scan. A PET-CT scan is the most appropriate next step to evaluate the extent of metastatic disease, especially involving areas such as the para-aortic lymph nodes. It provides whole body imaging and can identify active metabolic sites of cancer, guiding further treatment plans. Also from the last question. The PET-CT scan in the patient from the previous question shows metastases in the liver, lungs, and para-aortic lymph nodes. She is started on a regimen that includes paclitaxel. What is the mechanism of action of paclitaxel? A. Inhibition of toposomerase I. B. Alkylation of DNA. C. Stabilization of microtubules. D. Blockade of estrogen receptors. E. Inhibition of protein synthesis. The answer is C. Stabilization of microtubules. Paclitaxel works by stabilizing microtubules, preventing their disassembly. This disrupts the normal cell cycle and inhibits cell division which is particularly effective against rapidly dividing cells like cancer cells. The next lymph node cluster is the external iliac. The external iliac lymph nodes are located along the external iliac artery and its branches. They receive lymphatic drainage from the upper third of the vagina, the cervix, the body of the uterus, and the superior bladder. These nodes are commonly affected by sexually transmitted infections and medial foot or leg cellulitis that has spread to the superficial inguinal nodes. Question. A 22-year-old woman presents to the clinic with lower abdominal pain and vaginal discharge. Physical examination reveals tenderness over the lower abdomen and cervix, and enlarged external iliac lymph nodes are palpated. A swab confirms chlamydia trachomatis infection. Which antibiotic is the first line treatment for this condition? A. Penicillin. B. Doxycycline. C. Metronidazole. D. Vancomycin. E. Ciprofloxacin. The answer is, B. Doxycycline. 
Chlamydia trachomatis infections are commonly treated with doxycycline. The antibiotic acts by inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis. The presence of enlarged external iliac lymph nodes suggests local spread of the infection from the genital tract. Given the antibiotic chosen for the patient from the previous question, what is the mechanism of action of this antibiotic? A. Inhibition of cell wall synthesis. B. Inhibition of protein synthesis. C. Inhibition of DNA gyrase. D. Inhibition of folate synthesis. E. Disruption of bacterial cell membrane. The answer is, B. Inhibition of protein synthesis. Doxycycline is a tetracycline antibiotic that works by inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis. It binds to the 30S ribosomal subunit and prevents the association of aminoacyltrina with the bacterial ribosome. Another question. A 35-year-old man presents with redness and swelling on the medial aspect of his left foot. His external iliac lymph nodes are enlarged. What condition may account for the lymphadenopathy in this patient? A. Deep vein thrombosis. B. Peripheral arterial disease. C. Medial foot-slash-leg cellulitis. D. Lymphoma. E. Psoriasis. The answer is, C. Medial foot-slash-leg cellulitis. Given the redness and swelling on the medial aspect of the foot and the enlarged external iliac lymph nodes, this patient is likely experiencing medial foot or leg cellulitis that has spread to the superficial inguinal nodes and consequently to the external iliac nodes. Internal iliac lymph cluster. The internal iliac lymph nodes are situated near the internal iliac artery and are responsible for draining a wide variety of pelvic structures including the lower rectum to the anal canal, above the pectinate line middle third of the vagina, cervix, bladder, and prostate. Because they drain these vital pelvic and genitourinary organs, they are commonly involved in sexually transmitted infections, as well as conditions like medial foot or leg cellulitis that has spread to the superficial inguinal nodes. Questions time. A 50-year-old man presents with difficulty urinating and pelvic pain. On examination, you note enlarged internal iliac lymph nodes. Prostate-specific antigen, PSA. Levels are elevated. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Benign prostatic hyperplasia. B. Prostate cancer. C. Urinary tract infection. D. Renal calculi. E. Interstitial cystitis. The answer is, B. Prostate cancer. Given the elevated PSA and the enlarged internal iliac lymph nodes, the most likely diagnosis is prostate cancer. These lymph nodes receive drainage from the prostate and could be enlarged due to metastasis or local spread. Next question. A 28-year-old woman presents with pelvic pain, vaginal discharge, and dyspareunia. Physical examination reveals cervical motion tenderness and enlarged internal iliac lymph nodes. The most likely pathogen responsible for her condition is A. Neisseria gonorrhea B. Chlamydia trachomatis C. Trichomonas vaginalis D. Herpes simplex virus. E. Human papillomavirus. The answer is, B. Chlamydia trachomatis. The presentation is suggestive of pelvic inflammatory disease, and chlamydia trachomatis is one of the most common etiologic agents. The internal iliac lymph nodes drain the cervix and could be involved in such an infection. A 65-year-old man with a history of chronic constipation presence with rectal bleeding and enlarged internal iliac lymph nodes. A colonoscopy confirms rectal cancer. What is the most likely stage of his cancer? A. Stage 1. B. Stage 2. C. Stage 3. D. Stage 4. E. Stage 0. The answer is, C. Stage 3. The presence of enlarged internal iliac lymph nodes likely signifies nodal involvement, which typically corresponds to at least a stage 3 cancer. The nodes drain the lower rectum and could be involved in metastasis from rectal cancer. Superficial inguinal lymph nodes. The superficial inguinal lymph nodes are located in the groin region and primarily drain the skin below the umbilicus, the lower third of the vagina, the vulva, the scrotum, and the anal canal below the pectinate line. They are common sites of involvement in sexually transmitted infections, as well as medial foot or leg cellulitis that primarily involves the superficial inguinal nodes. Just a few questions for this cluster. A 24-year-old woman presents with a painful lesion on the vulva and inguinal lymphadenopathy. A viral culture confirms herpes simplex virus type 2, HASV2. What is the first-line antiviral medication for this condition? 
A. Acyclovir. B. Oseltamivir. C. Ribavirin. D. Zanamivir. E. Nantidine. The answer is A. Acyclovir. Acyclovir is the first line antiviral medication for treating HSV2 infections. It works by inhibiting viral DNA polymerase. The superficial inguinal lymph nodes may be involved due to their role in draining the vulva. Next question. A 45-year-old man presents with erythema and swelling on the medial aspect of his right foot. Examination reveals enlarged superficial inguinal lymph nodes on the right side. What is the most appropriate initial treatment? A. Oral amoxicillin. B. Intravenous vancomycin. C. Topical mupirocin. D. Oral cephalexin. E. Oral clindamycin. The answer is, D. Oral cephalexin. This patient has signs of medial foot slash leg cellulitis, which is most commonly caused by streptococcus or staphylococcus species. Initial treatment usually involves oral antibiotics such as cephalexin. One more question. A 19-year-old man presents with discharge from the urethra and inguinal lymphadenopathy. Gram stain of the urethral discharge shows gram-negative diplococci. What is the first-line treatment? A. Ceftriaxone. B. Penicillin. C. Azithromycin. D. Doxycycline. E. Metronidazole. The answer is A. Ceftriaxone. The gram-negative diplococci are suggestive of Neisseria gonorrhea. The first-line treatment for gonorrhea is ceftriaxone, a third-generation cephalosporin. The superficial inguinal lymph nodes are commonly involved in sexually transmitted infections, and they drain the lower third of the vagina, the vulva, and the scrotum, all of which could be affected in this condition. Let's talk about the popliteal lymph nodes. The popliteal lymph nodes are located behind the knee and are responsible for draining the dorsolateral foot and posterior calf. Given their anatomical location, they are most commonly involved in pathologies related to lateral foot or leg cellulitis. Let's try some questions. A 32-year-old woman presents with a swollen, erythematous dorsolateral area of her right foot. She also complains of pain behind her right knee. On examination, you find enlarged and tender popliteal lymph nodes. What is the most appropriate initial treatment for this patient? A. Oral amoxicillin. B. Intravenous vancomycin. C. Topical mupirocin. D. Oral cephalexin. E. Oral clindamycin. The answer is D. Oral cephalexin. The presentation is consistent with cellulitis affecting the dorsolateral foot, a condition most commonly caused by streptococcus or staphylococcus species. Cephalexin is an appropriate initial oral antibiotic for treating this type of bacterial infection. Next question. A patient presents with erythema and warmth on the posterior calf and tenderness behind the knee. Which set of lymph nodes are most likely to be enlarged in this patient? A. Superficial inguinal. B. Popliteal. C. Axillary. D. Deep cervical. E. Mediastinal. The answer is B. Popliteal. The popliteal lymph nodes are located behind the knee and are responsible for draining the dorsolateral foot and posterior calf. Given the area of involvement in this case, enlargement of the popliteal nodes is most likely. A patient with known heart failure presents with a swollen dorsolateral foot and enlarged popliteal lymph nodes. Which of the following conditions must be differentiated from bacterial cellulitis in this case? A. Venous stasis. B. Lymphedema. C. Diabetic foot ulcer. D. Gout. E. Steomyelitis. The answer is A. Venous stasis. Patients with heart failure are at risk for fluid retention and venous stasis, which could present a swelling of the lower extremities. The symptoms might mimic those of cellulitis, so it's important to differentiate between the two. The absence of signs like warmth and erythema would make venous stasis more likely than cellulitis. Very important note. Right lymphatic duct drains right side of body above diaphragm into junction of the right subclavian and internal jugular vein. Remember. Right side, right above, right duct right side, the right lymphatic duct drains the right side of the body. Right above, it only handles the regions above the diaphragm. Right duct, it flows right into the junction of the right subclavian and internal jugular veins. Let's try some questions. A 45-year-old man undergoes a surgical procedure involving the right subclavian vein. Postoperatively, he develops swelling on the right side of his neck and upper extremity. 
Which of the following lymphatic structures is most likely damaged? A. Thoracic duct. B. Left lymphatic duct. C. Right lymphatic duct. D. Cisterna cali. E. Mediastinal lymph node. The answer is, C. Right lymphatic duct. The right lymphatic duct drains the right side of the body above the diaphragm and empties into the junction of the right subclavian and internal jugular vein. Damage to this structure during surgery involving the right subclavian vein could result in localized lymphedema on the right upper side of the body, including the neck. Next question. During a lecture on lymphatic drainage, a medical student asks where the right arm's lymph fluid eventually drains. Which of the following is the most accurate answer? A. Into the junction of the left subclavian and internal jugular vein. B. Into the cisterna cali. C. Into the junction of the right subclavian and internal jugular vein. D. Directly into the thoracic duct. E. Into the left lymphatic duct. The answer is C. Into the junction of the right subclavian and internal jugular vein. The lymph from the right arm, as well as the right side of the body above the diaphragm, drains into the right lymphatic duct. This duct empties into the junction of the right subclavian and internal jugular veins. Therefore, the most accurate answer is that the lymph fluid from the right arm will eventually drain into this junction. We've just covered an extensive range of lymph node clusters, their respective areas of drainage, and associated pathologies. This comprehensive exercise not only delves into the core anatomy and clinical correlates of the lymphatic system but also provides an excellent test preparation strategy through the formulation of USMLE Step 1 style questions. We started with the submandibular and submental cluster, touching upon oral cavity related pathologies, and moved downwards to address more distant clusters like the axillary, epitrochlear, and celiac clusters. Special emphasis was placed on potential USMLE trick questions involving differential diagnoses, treatment options, and underlying mechanisms of action for various drugs. Some of the key points to remember. 1. Right lymphatic duct, drains the right side of the body above the diaphragm into the junction of the right subclavian and internal jugular vein. Mnemonic, right side, right above, right duct. 2. Cervical and mediastinal clusters, Keep an eye out for respiratory conditions, infectious diseases, and malignancies that affect these regions. 3. Axillary and epitrochlear clusters, particularly important in cases involving the upper limb and breast pathologies. 4. Gastrointestinal clusters, celiac and mesenteric clusters often present with similar conditions but drain different regions of the GI tract. And 5. Inguinal and popliteal clusters, important for understanding sexually transmitted infections and cellulitis. Revisit this video to learn again. More videos coming. Good luck with your studying and exam. Thank you so much for watching. Please watch other immunodeficiencies videos. And, please subscribe, comment, and like. Don't forget to share this video with your classmates. See you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like, share and comment. See you in the next video.